We thank you, Lord, because you are faithful in allowing us to gather together as a church, though we are not in full force at this time, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, O God, for our members that are watching online. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, continue to bless them also, that they may be able, Lord, to uh, listen attentively to the duration of their service, and that they can fellowship with us, Lord, uh, with your word. I pray that you will forgive me, Lord, of my sins, because, Lord, I am not worthy. I am just a sinner saved by your grace, still struggling in the flesh, O God, but trusting in the Holy Spirit that I may be led, Lord, continually to your will and to do your will, Lord, in my life. Help me, Lord, as I preach to your people today. May the message be an encouragement to us as we look at the uh, church in Smyrna regarding, Lord, what they experience. But in spite of all those things, your faithfulness in their lives. May we see all these things, Lord, in the light of what is happening in our time today. And may we be like them, continue to keep on keeping on, knowing, Lord, that you will always be with us. May you be glorified, Lord, in our midst. And I pray, Lord, for our brethren who are sick, make them well, O God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. And thank you very much for standing. So we're going to, last time we, uh, the last time that I preached, actually, before the last time, I preached about the church at Ephesus. We can see that the church at Ephesus is uh, actually the, the only church that was mentioned in the seven churches that the Apostle Paul wrote and the epistle, actually. We can also see that Ephesus, though, is a very strong church and a very active church, fall into the uh, uh, area of losing their first love. We saw uh, uh, in this church at Ephesus that they did not lose their zeal in serving the Lord. We saw that they still have the activities. Actually, they are filled with activities concerning the things of God. They are withstanding those that are uh, trying to to show themselves as apostles or prophets or preachers and they were found as false by these people so they are doctrinally sound but we also saw that in spite of all of these things that may happen in a very active church they actually lost their first love it means that they are doing things not for the Lord himself but they're doing things for themselves, thinking that they are glorifying God. You see, God is not interested in what we do. God is interested in who we are. We may do so many things, but we, if we do not keep our close, personal, intimate relationship with God, then everything that we are doing will just come to waste. Because it is being done for ourselves. It is being done because of pride it is being done because of duty it is being done because we have to do it what god wants is that we are doing things because we love him and that is the supreme motive and the only motive that is acceptable to god amen that's why he says that if you love me keep my commandments he did that say keep my commandments because you love me but if you love me, then you need to keep my commandments. We do not obey God for anything else. Some, some people obey God in order to get blessing. Some people obey God in order not to be punished. Some people obey God uh, in order to, to pacify their conscience. But what God wants from each and every Christian is we obey God because we love him. That is what God is looking at and what God is looking for. So, the church at Ephesus was chastised by God for leaving their first love. And I believe that is the worst thing that we can do. That is to leave our first love. That is to have a, a, a higher degree of love 
to other people or things or places above God. And that is always idolatry. Amen? The Bible says that we must love the Lord thy God with all our hearts, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength, with everything that we have. Now, going to the second church where the Lord wrote a letter is the church at Smyrna. Smyrna is the second church address in Revelation. Prophetically, we will look at the prophetical uh, uh, understanding or interpretation of the seven uh, churches in Revelation. Smyrna covers the period of AD 100 to 312. Because you might be wondering, why is it that uh, the Lord did not, the, the Apostle Paul did not write any epistle to these churches? Like, like the church at Philadelphia. It is a very strong church, a very good church, a, a, a church that loves God and loves everybody. So why is it that there is no epistle written to the churches at Philadelphia? Well, because if you will look, even at the church in Smyrna, there was no epistle written because they covered the period 8100 to 312, and this was the time when the Apostle Paul was no more. So he could not possibly write a letter to them or... It was established by the Christian who were scattered abroad during the time that the Apostle Paul had finished read, writing his epistle to the churches. But God saw to it that he wrote a letter to these churches making us understand that there are so many different facets in the life of a church, not only during those times, but even in our time. Amen. So, AD 100 to AD 312, just short, one year short of uh, the time of Constantine, the great, when he made Catholicism as a strong religion. When he, start, he started to baptize his soldier, seeing a sign in heaven uh, like a cross and Seeing a uh, phrase that says, In ad in hoc signos vince, by design conquer. So he interpreted that God wanted him to become a Christian in order for him to conquer the world. So the population, uh, Smyrna is about 40 miles north of Ephesus. And the population during that time were around 200 to 250,000 people. That is already a great number during the time. Because uh, unlike in our time, Manila alone have more than 14 or 15 million people. But during that time, uh, there are still not too many people. And people are actually scattered in many places. So the main export of the city was Mir. Hence the name is Mir Na. Mir is a spice that is used in embalming and perfume. And this can be a very significant, uh, in the name of this place, or the Christian in this place, because this church was persecuted for their faith. And some of them are persecuted unto death. So these martyrs provide a sweet smell, like mir, in the nose of the Lord. So they are being crushed because the only way for you to get the uh, good smell of mirror is to crush it. If you're not going to crush it, you're not going to smell the uh, fragrance of this uh, particular spice. So it is also that until and unless Christians are crushed, most of the time we cannot see the significance and God cannot smell the fragrance of his people. Sometimes it needs martyrdom in order for us to show our faith in the Lord. You see, there is a tendency that we take for granted our freedom and the privilege that we have. And when these things were taken, then that may perhaps be the time for some to show what their faith is really made of. And it's so sad that 
sometimes that time is needed in order for us to realize the uh, importance of, of the uh, liberty, the freedom that God is giving us. Amen? Like for, like, like, for example, today, in the Philippines, in America, in most places in the world, we are free to gather together and worship the Lord, except because uh, there is a pandemic now. But before this pandemic, we are free to gather, and yet some people do not, some Christians do not even go to the church. And they even try to do other things or go to other places than worshiping the Lord during Lord's Day. So we take it for granted, and once it's taken away from us, then we are going to miss gathering together and worshiping the Lord together in a place where the Lord called us to gather ourselves. So Smyrna is a what we call architecturally famous. It is easily the most beautiful city in Asia Minor during the time. Alexander the Great even determined to make Smyrna the model Greek city. So we know that Alexander the Great almost conquered the world. And he wanted to make Smyrna as the model among the city in Greece. So they said that if you will go to Smyrna and you will go to a high place overlooking Smyrna, you will see a, uh, a, a, the arrangement of temples that it is like a crown. That is why they call Smyrna as the crown of Asia. That is how beautiful is Smyrna. So many temples, paved road. They even said that there is a, uh, a golden uh, road in that uh, particular city. So it is architecturally famous. Not only that, but economically, Smyrna was flourishing during this time. Why? Because it is a port city. And if you are a port city, there is a great uh, activity of international trade. So, so Smyrna was uh, economically prosperous, ju pr uh, prosperous during this time. So you can see that if you're looking at the different cities during that time, one of the most prosperous city is this place, Smyrna. And not only that, but politically, Smyrna was faithful to Rome. Smyrna is known for its faithfulness to Rome. During the, that, the time, this time, there were six cities that were nominated to build a uh, temple for Rome, and Smyrna won that nomination. They were chosen to build a temple in honor of Rome. So they are known for their faithfulness to Rome with unquestioned alliance to Caesar and whoever will be the emperor of the Roman Empire. So this is Smyrna. They are, a it's a beautiful place. It is a prosperous place. And it is a place that is dedicated to the glory of Rome. And that is the reason why the church here in Smyrna was persecuted because of their opposition to sin and to idolatry. If you are a Christian, you need to oppose to sin. You need to oppose to idolatry. So when you do that in a place where they make the emperor as God, then you are in great trouble. So it is, it is uh, very much the same in our time today, wherein uh, we need to oppose to the sin that is happening today, but as we do that, we are being singled out by society, like the LGBT community. Because we speak something against it, we are being judged as bigot, we are being judged as hateful, we are being judged as intolerant, while all the thing that we are actually doing is opposing sin so that righteousness will continue to bloom. But they said that church is not essential anymore. In other places, church is even being uh, labeled as a uh, group that is trying to disturb peace in society. Why? Because we do not want to accept all kinds of people. We only accept people who loves the Lord. We love all people, but as a church, we must always be opposed to every sin and idolatry that is happening in our world today. Amen.
And that is the reason why the church is being persecuted. If the church will stand for what is right, there will always be persecution. But if the church will not mind what is happening around him, then there will be no persecution. But that church cannot glorify God in his life, in, 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 in a, her life. That church is not going to be a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of the Lord. But it is a church that will lose its glory. So the church of Smyrna, as Smyrna is considered as the martyr church. So let us look at this church that faced persecution but was encouraged by the Lord Jesus Christ to continue on in spirit despite of all these things, for his glory. Let us look at our text in the Revelation chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible says here, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. You see, this letter was written to the angel and to the church. Not to the angel that's flying, but to the pastor and the church at Ismirna. We know that the church means a called out assembly. Amen. In a particular locality. This letter was written only to Ismirna, but secondarily, it is applicable to all churches. But primarily, this letter is written to Smyrna during that particular time, only in that particular place. That is why a local church is a called out assembly in a certain locality. That's why a person cannot be a part of a church where he does not live. That is impossible. That is a misnomer. That is not uh, uh, practical and that cannot happen because you cannot assemble when you are away from the assembly so it is a called out assembly this people or this church it was no ordinary group why because they has, they had been called by god and if god is the one who called you then your calling is something special then your calling is heavenly then your calling is the highest calling it is a privilege to be called by god amen i do not know what position other people may occupy that they are so proud of but if you are called by god then you occupy the highest position that a person can occupy in this world amen a man or a person or a group called by god they were unlike most group of that day because they were not serving idols, but they are serving a risen Savior. Amen. They are the only ones who are serving a Savior who was dead and is alive. And that separates Christianity from any other group in this world. Amen. So, the message was given by Christ himself to them. Notice his description of himself as he wrote to this church at Smyrna. He says, I am the first and the last. Let us understand that these people are suffering. That these people are in deep persecution. And then the Lord Jesus Christ wrote to them a letter. And the Lord told them that I am the first and the last. Meaning to say, I am the I am. Meaning to say that I am there at the beginning and I will be there at the end. Meaning to say that no matter what you are experiencing at this time, I am with you from the beginning and until the end of your persecution or your life, God is telling them, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen? That is what he's trying to tell them. Not only that, he not only said that I am the first and the last, he also said that I am he which was dead and is alive. So he's telling them, you're not alone in what you're experiencing. I myself was rejected. I myself was uh, uh, crucified. 
I myself suffered at the hands of sinner. So I understand what you are going through. I understand your suffering. I understand everything that is going on in your mind. And because I understand, I will be able to help and comfort you in times like this. Amen? And I know that they are going to continually persecute you and even take your life. But don't worry, I died too. But I rose again. Yes, you may die for your faith. You may die because of persecution, but be of good cheer because one day you are going to live again. Amen? And that is the motivation why we should keep on keeping on because our hope is not in this world only. Our hope is in another world. Our hope is in the life beyond this life. And our hope is with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we keep on keeping on, no matter how hard the way may be. That is what the Lord Jesus Christ is telling them. I am the first and the last. I am he which was dead and is alive. So this group was not a group with no purpose. They have a purpose. And that is to keep on showing their light shining even though there are so many dark clouds trying to cover that light. To continue to be the salt of the earth even though life is being squeezed out of them. But they need to keep on keeping on because in the midst of all of this, God is always with them. Amen. This was not a group with no future because their future is already secured. That even if they will be a martyr to that, they are going to live again with the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians, this world is not our home. We are just passing through. All our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. So no matter how hard this world may be, so no matter uh, if we do not have things that this world can provide, there is coming a day that we will be in the place that God has prepared for us and there we will enjoy His presence, His glory, His reward, and we will be with Him forevermore. Amen? That's how no matter how hard it is, we keep on keeping on. We keep on pressing. Why? Because we are the church of the living God. And Jesus was our authority for existence and is the reason why we keep on pressing on by the grace of God. And that is what we have today. We are not serving a dead idol, but we are serving a risen Savior. Amen? And because He lives, we can face tomorrow. Because He lives, then we should not fear because we know that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for each and every one of us. Like Job, we can say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Amen. He's alive. We're not like other religions who are serving a dead person. We're serving a person that who cannot help them. But we're serving the true and the living God, and the God who experienced everything that we're experiencing, yet without sin, but he was able to succor or help us because he knows what we are going through. Amen? That's why in verse 9 he says, I know thy works. So that is our God. Amen? God knows everything. God knows what their position is, and God knows what they are experiencing. So, God knew where they were and the problems that they face. And do you know who our God is? Can we turn to Nahum chapter 1, verse number 7? You see, when there is problem, when there is trouble, we need not be sad or despondent. Because look at our God. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. You see, most of the time, we will know God more intimately during the times of trouble, during the times of crisis, during the times of problem. When we find our, our backs 
that is against the wall where there is no more uh, way to escape not even to the left nor to the right when when we think that everything is lost when we think that there is no more hope god said that he will show his, himself strong in the day of trouble and he knoweth them that trust in him amen that is our god so when trouble comes who are you going to call the lord jesus amen wag yung ghostbuster walang maitutulong sa atin yan amen so he knoweth them that trust in him you see during these times we may feel that we are alone but remember, Christ knows those who are His. And He knew what's happening in our lives. And He is able to help us if we will continually trust the Lord. Amen? So, He knew some things about Smyrna. You know, it's interesting that among, among the seven uh, letters in the seven churches of Asia, only two were never rebuked or chastised by the Lord. The church of Smyrna and Philadelphia. But the five other churches were sharply rebuked by the Lord. So we can see that even though Smyrna is maybe suffering the most intense persecution, God did not see anything or reveal anything that is wrong with this church. Amen? So you see, sometimes in the midst of persecution, Christians are keeping their purity. But in the midst of freedom and plenty and, and, and uh, plenty and, and prosperity, the church is playing with sin and is actually moving away from the holiness that God wants her to have. He says, "I know thy work." Christ was aware of the work that they are doing through the faith that God has given them. He realized they were laboring in the harvest, even in the face of death. You see, it is very hard to win souls when you are persecuted. It is very hard to win souls when the government or the authorities will punish you when you are caught doing that. It is even hardest to win souls. When by simply doing it, it will cost you your life. In, you see, in our time, we can, we can do soul winning almost any time or even every time. But we do not do it. Why? Well, maybe we're waiting for persecution. I hope not. But that is something that we need to do as a church and as a child of the Lord. But one thing that we need to realize here is that God is aware of our works. It may not be payday at the end of the month, but if we are laboring for Christ, payday is coming soon. Just keep working for the Lord. Why? Because He is aware of what we are doing. You may feel that your work is in vain or unnoticed by people, but keep on pressing on. Because God has a book, and everything that we do is written in that book. Amen? And we will be rewarded accordingly by the grace of God. Do you remember at the conclusion of Paul's great presentation of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, after he said that we will die, yes, but like Jesus, we will live again, and then death will have no more sting against us? And in that conclusion, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. What you're doing, God knows. Your labor is not in vain. It may be in vain in the sight of men. It may be in vain in the sight of other people. It may be in vain in the sight of your, your relatives and loved ones. But let me assure you today that our work is not in vain in the Lord. And that is what really matters. What we are doing for God and how God sees 
what we are doing for him. So he says, I know thy works. And tribulation. Not only that he knew their work, but he knew their tribulation. God was aware of their tribulation. Tribulation has a meaning of pressure or pressing together. It carries the idea of a great millstone. Alam natin yun yung nung unang panahon, yun ba pagka nagagawa tayo ng galapong? Ano tayong tawag doon? Kung ano man yun. Di ba? Yun yung grinder. Talagang ilalagay mo rin yung bigas at talagang pag dinaanan nun, madudurog. Lalagyan mo ng tubig, magiging liquid. It has that idea of crushing and grinding the shaft from the wheat. So he was aware of the great pressure that these people are under. What's this pressure? Number one, they were attacked politically. Is political persecution is very hard. Because political persecution is backed by the government. And there is nothing that you can do if you are politically persecuted or if you are politically attacked. They were being snatched out of their homes. Even without arrest warrant. Even if only somebody will choo choo them or will tell uh, the authorities that these people are Christians, these people are worshiping uh, God, they're not worshiping Caesar. So the, the soldier will go to the house and will take them out and will drag them into the street and will put them in prison and even execute them in the sight of people. Making them an example that if you're not going to follow Rome politically, then it will cost you your life. You see, during this time, Rome expanded her kingdom. And with the expansion of kingdom, there will be diverse people. Iba-ibang tao. Iba-ibang kultura. Iba-ibang custom. So, it is very hard to unify diverse people. Sa Pilipinas nga lang, pag pinagsama mo kapampangan, tsaka bisaya, mag-aaway. Kaya nga, ang church, minsan ang hirap. May kapampangan, may bisaya, may Tagalog, may Ilocano. Pagdating sa contribution, ayaw ng Ilocano. Pahirapan. Hindi. Talagang tight ang hawak nila. Pagdating naman sa yung uh, mga activities, ang mga bisaya, very active. Mga kapampangan naman, iitim ako. Masyadong anong kapampangan, eh, conscious sa itsura niya. Eh. Ah, pagdating naman sa lutuan, kahit ikaw iluluto ka ng kapampangan at maglalasa kang masarap. So it is very hard to, to uh, unite these people. So Rome is facing a dilemma. How can Rome keep the kingdom strong and the people obeying? Because you see, if you conquer a country, if you uh, put a country under ka captivity, the natural reaction is to revolt. And to try to bring down the force that uh, put them into captivity. So Rome solved this problem by introducing emperor worship. So they introduced to all of the, uh, uh, the places that Rome was able to annex to their country what we call emperor worship. So every citizen of Rome or every citizen that is part of the kingdom of Rome is asked every year to stand in front of the bust of Caesar and pledge his allegiance in worshiping Caesar. So you see, it is very easy for pagan to do that because they already worship a multiplicity of God. But it is going to be very, very hard for Christians to do that. Because they are faced with a choice. Pledging their allegiance to Caesar means freedom and liberty, but a compromise in their faith. And uh, giving their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ is something that they must do, but it can cost them their lives. So by doing so, 
Rome was able to pinpoint and identify potential problems in every country that they were able to annex so they can easily crush a revolt that may happen but those that suffered much are the Christians because they could not give their allegiance to Caesar they can only give their allegiance to the Lord hence the political persecution of the Christians during the time not only that they were attacked politically but they were attacked economically the Bible says I know thy poverty they are poor well Smyrna is a prosperous place but why are these people poor let's look at it you see first in Greek word there are two words for poverty number one is penia and yeah, see brother Gomer poverty it describes a, a man who has nothing to spare nothing extra ito yung sapat lang so consider kang mahirap if you only meet I were able to meet both ends both ends meet mahirap ka no hindi ka mayaman kasi sakto lang tanggap gastos walang sobra hindi ka nakukulang pero wala kang sobra and that is penia but the other greek word is tochian tochian it describes the man who has nothing at all walang wala talaga and this was the word used by the Lord Jesus Christ to describe the situation of these Christians in Smyrna. They have nothing at all. They are very, very poor. Sabi nga sa Tagalog, sunugin mo man sila, hindi sila mangangamoy singko. Walang wala itong mga taong ito. What is the reason? Well, uh, during today's health and wealth movement sad to say even the Baptist churches were infiltrated by this philosophy these churches will be condemned and they will be judged as being outside the will of God why? because if our father is rich why are you suffering? that is because you're not obeying the father that is because you're not claiming the promise that is because you're not asking so you are not receiving they will be judged by churches that are big and prosperous has so much money in the bank has beautiful buildings air-conditioned uh, places padded views they will be judged why because they will tell them sad to say i've heard this he said pastors the reason you are poor is because you are against or outside the will of god ladies and gentlemen the answer is an emphatic no. They suffered because they are actually in the will of God. They suffered because they stand for their faith. They suffered and they are poor because they pledged their allegiance to the true and living God. Not to the emperor, not to any idols, but they worship God and God alone. And because of this stand, they became poor. Poverty became their lot. Listen to me. Prosperity is not God's will for our people. That isn't God's will for people. If God wanted you to be rich, fine. Good. Do not be tempted by your riches. Use it for the glory of God. But it is not God's will for everyone. Yes, they are living in a prosperous city, but because they confess Christ as Lord, their jobs were taken away from them. Their properties were taken away from them. Their hope and their dash were broken by the government. Why? Because they do not want to compromise with them. May mga times ka na, kapag ka may ari iglesia, pag di ka iglesia, wala kang chance eh. They will not give you any chance because you are not part of what they believe so here they were destitute here they have no money here they are suffering here they are in deep poverty but to Christ he says thou art rich amen and that's what matters 
Even though we may not have things in this world, even though we may not enjoy the things that this world can offer, what is important is that in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are rich. Amen? You see, Christ's set of value is different from the world. You see, for the Lord Jesus Christ, the only way up is down. The only way to gain is to lose. The only way to have is to give. And for Him, these people may be poor, but they are rich. Listen, we can lack much of this world's good, yet be rich toward God, rich in faith, rich in good work, and our treasures is in heaven. As long as we serve God and serve God with all of our hearts, then in the eyes of Jesus, we are rich. Amen. Malay ka ng pera, wala ka namang paglilingkod sa Diyos. Wala ka ng pera, pero punong-puno ka naman ng paglilingkod sa Diyos. Dapat kasi alam natin yung tamang kasabihan. Hindi baling mahirap basta't mayaman sa paglilingkod sa Diyos. Hindi tulad yung sabi ng isa. Kasi napakatamad niyan. Sabi niya, hindi baling tamad, hindi naman pagod. Hindi ganun ang mga kasabihan. Mga walang kabuluhan yun. Ang may kabuluhan, yung kasabihan na sinususugan ng Biblia. Amen? That ye may not enjoy the riches of this world. But if you have God, then you have everything by the grace of God. Why? Because Jesus is more than enough. More than enough. So they were attacked, number one, politically. They were attacked, number two, economically. Number three, they were attacked religiously. Let us go back to our text, please. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. You see, the Jews should have uh, sympathized with them. But what happened is that the greatest persecution, listen, came actually from the Jews. And the Lord described these Jews as the synagogue of Satan. What worse description can a group of people receive than being mentioned by God as the synagogue of Satan? So, and I know the blasphemy of them. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy means slander or speaking against. In our time, it is called libel or defamation. So, that's why there are synagogue of Satan who are not here anymore. And they slander and defame people. The Jews who were hostile against Christianity began to spread lies about the believers. What they are being accused of is not true actually. But they are being slandered, destroyed by these people. So their reputation is being ruined. That is why they are being marginalized in the society because of the religious label that is given to them. Pastor, what are the accusations that they are spreading against the church in Smyrna? You will be surprised. Number one is cannibalism. Hmm, Pastor, where did you get that cannibalism? Well, don't you know they celebrate the Lord's Supper and during the Lord's Supper, the Lord says, take my body and eat and drink my blood. So they said that these people are eating the actual body and drinking actual blood. Therefore, they are cannibals. So it's being spread in the society against them. That those Christians, we cannot trust them. Why? They are cannibals. They, there is a, a danger that they will even eat us when they have eaten each other. So they are cannibals. And only that, they were even labeled as atheists. Just look at the irony. They are the ones who is worshiping the only true and the living God. Yet they were called atheists. How? Because they refused to worship the pagan idol, uh, the uh, gods that were enshrined in pagan idols. So because they do not worship 
the gods of these people, they were labeled atheist that they do not believe in God or in gods so that is why they were persecuted religiously by being atheists number three they were accused as sexual perverts they were accused of having or committing sexual orgies or swapping wives and husbands with one another Nag, nagkukumitaw sila ng sexual audio, nagpapalitan ng asawa. Why? As they speak of being members of one another and loving one another. So for the pagans, they said that they are loving, sexually involved with one another. And not only that, but they are uh, accused of breaking up families. Why? Because of their message calling for highest allegiance to Christ. Remember the teaching of Christ? Whosoever will not hate mother nor father is not worthy of me. So that is why they were accused of breaking up families. That is why these people are the most hated people during that time. That's why they were persecuted like this. They are persona non grata. They are undesirables. They are parasite and they are menace to society. That's why they should be rounded up and destroyed just like the Jews during the time of Hitler. That they should be annihilated. Because of who? Because of the synagogue of Satan. They were called synagogue of Satan because the Jews, these Jews oppose everything that is God that is good and that is godly. And people who do not worship the true and the living God will always find a way to accuse us of in order to destroy the good things and the godly things that we are doing for the Lord and even for society. So they were attacked politically. They were attacked economically. They were attacked Religiously, and of course, they were attacked physically. Look at verse number 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. So this is political. That ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto that, and I will give thee a crown of life. So this church had suffered... And this church continued to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. As I have said a while ago, the Roman officials will break into their homes and arrest them, arrest the believers before their family, in front of their family. They will drag into the street, into the Roman prison, and sometimes executed in front of so many people, making them an, uh, an example of what will happen to people that will not worship the emperor of Rome. But pastor, what does it mean that they will be, uh, they shall have tribulation 10 days, only 10 days? Well, uh, this is not literal 10 days. There are many different interpretations. Uh, one interpretation, according to Bible scholars, that they will suffer persecution uh, during the 10 emperors of Rome, 10 consecutive emperors that comprise more than 200 years. So, look at the suffering that they experience. At least 213 years. And of course, many different interpretations. But I do not look at that. You know what I'm looking at? The word 10 days. It means that no matter how hard it is, God put a limit on our suffering. Amen? It will not last forever. No matter how hard it is right now, one day, it's going to end. No matter how dark it is right now, one day we will see the silver lining. No matter how far we are traveling in that tunnel, there will always be a light at the end of the tunnel and God will see to it that our persecution, our tribulation, our problem will one day end when the Lord Jesus Christ will come for his own and he will take us out of this world and bring us to heaven 
to be together with him forever and forever. Amen? There is a limit. Are you suffering? There is a limit. It will not be forever. And during that suffering, God will give you the strength. As he encourages them that I am with you the, from the beginning and the end of that suffering. And I experienced that more than you have experienced that. So I know what you're going through. And I will help you. And ladies and gentlemen, our crying may endure only for the night. But joy will always come. In the morning, amen. You see, our churches today are under pressure. There is pressure from within and without, pressure from the pew, from the pulpit, and the public. But even though we have all of this pressure, we can be strong under pressure because Christ knows our worry and He is with us. So we are not carrying that pressure alone. He is with us together in these things. He has never left us. He will never do that. He never leave us. He will always be with us. That is why he says, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Do not fear. Because it will not last forever. Do not fear that even if you die, actually when you die, that's the end of it. No matter what happened, do not Fear what the devil can do for you, will do against you. They will cast you into prison. They will kill you. They will have experienced so many tribulations in your life. But he encouraged them to be faithful unto the end. This is the message. It may be hard, but keep on keeping on. It may not be favorable, but keep on keeping on. We may experience hardnesses in life. But keep on keeping on. Remember, Paul told Timothy that you need to endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because our faith counts the most when we are against many odds in our lives. Amen? Keep on keeping on. He says, Be thou faithful unto that, and I will give thee a crown of life. Listen, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. You said, well, we are in a situation where everything is good. We are in a situation that everything is easy. We have freedom. We have, oh, all is okay. So we are good. No, we're not. Do you know why? Because tribulation is the condition that can make us qualified for a crown of life. This is not salvation. This is reward. It is a crown that will be given unto us. So if we will not be faithful in spite of tribulation, then we cannot re receive the crown of life. That's why he says, Be thou faithful unto death. Do not be worried in well-doing. Don't stop. Keep on keeping on. Keep on going until the end. And he says, I will give thee a crown of life. You see, they seemingly had nothing to rejoice about. There was suffering and persecution on every hand. It would have been easy for them to quit and to give up. Why? Because they will be cast into prison and they will be killed. And this was not a message to shout about. They probably had hoped for a message of deliverance, but God gave them a message of endurance. Keep on keeping on. Serve me until you die. And when you do that, he said, I am going to give you a crown of life. And then he gave a message of hope. He says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. It is a reward for faithfulness in the midst of persecution, problems, and tribulation. And then Jesus also promised life beyond the grave. He says in verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Amen? We know what the second death is. The second death refers to the judgment 
of God reserved for those who deny Christ or the great white throne judgment where all of those that will be judged will be cast into the lake of fire. Those in Smyrna may have been called upon to give their very lives for the faith. But that would not be the end. That would only be the beginning. The great D.L. Moody said, He who is born once will die twice. But he that is born twice will die once. Amen? Meaning to say that we have eternal life. So listen, I cannot say what lies ahead for us. I do not know. We are in a very unsettling situation. Unpredictable. We thought everything is going good and then it will turn to worse. Anyway, the Bible says that in the last days, things will become worse and worse. There may be more dark days to come. But don't worry for the same. There is always a brighter day ahead. Look at James 1.12. And we're almost done. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Amen. Which the Lord that promised to them that love him. That's going to be a glorious day. What a day that will be. What a glorious day that will be. You see, this world is difficult at best. But that is not the end of it. We must take courage in the Lord. You know why? Because he is our high tower. He is our hiding place. And no matter how poor we may be in this world and forgotten, we will always be remembered by him. And we will always be rich in him. The Lord says, I know thy poverty. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, thou art rich. Praise God. We are not in this situation. But praise God still. Even if we will be put in this situation. Why? Because God saw to it that we will be tooled to overcome even when we face this situation. Let us always remember Smyrna, the church that suffered so much tribulation in life. The church that is martyred for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the church that kept on keeping on for Jesus until death. And I believe at the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ, the saints at Smyrna will be at the front of those that will be rewarded for the glory of God. Shall we stand our place? Every head's bowed. So we heard this message about the church 